Hi everyone, Happy New Year. Welcome back to the ACNC's 2020 webinar schedule. Today's webinar, um, we will aim to shed a little bit of light on how the ACNC investigates, investigates charities. Uh, today we'll work to explain to charities as well as any members of the wider public that have joined us today, the types of steps and processes the ACNC works through when looking at charities, as well as how we respond to public concerns and the compliance actions we can pursue. Uh, my name's Chris Richards, I'm from the ACNC's education team. Joining me today is Ian Parry, who is a Senior Compliance Manager in our compliance team. Hi, Ian. Hi, Chris, and hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to have this opportunity to provide information and raise some awareness about how the ACNC investigates charities. Indeed, indeed. Now, we've got a bit to get through, as seems to be the case always. So I'm going to quickly cover our usual housekeeping points before we launch in. If you've got any troubles with the audio for the webinar, you can try listening through your phone. You can call the number listed in the email you will have received when you registered. Uh, there'll be an access code you can put in and you can listen to the webinar that way. You can ask a question at any time through the webinar by using the tools in the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. Uh, we've got a few colleagues. We've got uh, Matt, we've got Sarah Jane, we've got, um, who else we got? We've got Gulna, who, uh, who, is, uh, who are all helping out and all uh, going to do some typing and some bits and pieces. Um, we're going to try to answer all the questions that will come through during the webinar, but depending on the quantity of them, we may not get to every single one. If your question isn't answered through the web webinar, we will get back to you later on via email. Also, just a quick reminder that while we can help answer general queries you may have, any compliance specific queries that your charity um, might have uh, might be better directed to our advice support line, and that's 132262. Uh, they can access, they can help out with some more individual queries uh, and give you some sort of individual advice and, and, and information too. We're recording this webinar, as you probably already know, the recording as well as the transcript and the presentation slides, they'll be published on the ACNC, ACNC website in the coming days. We will send out a follow-up email to everyone who's registered uh, to let you know that it's available. Um, the follow-up email will also contain all the useful links and all the other resources that we mentioned through today's webinar. Now, one thing we do have is uh, some handouts. One of them is the list of useful links and resources. Now, our handouts, if, you, uh, if you're interested in grabbing a couple of them, we'll reference them during uh, the webinar today, but they are available. Um, if you have a look on your GoToWebinar interface, you should see a handout section. Uh, now, there's four handouts available, including the actual slides that you're about to see. Um, you can view them or download them for later on, um, depending on what you wish to do. So have a look, and, and if you want to have a look at a couple of the um, a couple of the handouts, feel free. Finally, we value your feedback. If there's any uh, any way that we can improve our webinars, let us know. We have a short survey at the end of today's session. All right, that's the preliminaries done. What we're going to cover today, first thing we're going to do, we'll give an outline of the ACNC's regulatory approach. Um, how, as an agency, we go about regulating Australia's 57,000 and a bit registered charities. This is an important starting point, uh, important context when it comes to looking at charity investigations. Thanks, Chris. Yes, and we're also going to have a look at how the ACNC receives concerns and what the ACNC does with the concerns when we receive them. The process is in place and how we communicate with charities and work with them. Third thing we're going to, uh, third thing we're going to look at um, is obviously the investigations uh, process. What happens in a situation where there's an investigation? What are the steps? What do we do? How long these things take? The, the processes and what they involve. And we'll also look at the types of actions the ACNC can take in response to the concerns that we receive and the investigations we undertake, as well as explaining in a bit more detail the range of actions that we take when we receive these concerns. Cool. And the last one, facts, figures and dispelling myths. We're going to dispel some myths about our processes and, uh, and that sort of thing. We're also going to provide some facts and figures and some clarity about what happens uh, when we obviously receive a concern or investigate your charity. So that's the to-do list, that's the rundown. Now, ACNC investigations and, and that sort of process are overseen by our compliance team. 
as we can see here, the compliance directorate and, and team, we'll call them a team, it's probably a better way of putting it, yep. works to address risks that pose a threat to the trust and confidence in the charity sector. Now, Ian, broadly, what are some of the things that the compliance team do to fulfil this role? Yeah, so primarily it's about identifying concerns and make sure we respond appropriately uh, to address those concerns. But principally, the starting point, I think, is about gathering information. So we get information from a range of sources, uh, including the public. Yeah. Uh, the public can be a wealth of information to help the ACNC understand what's happening in the charity sector in terms of non-compliance. So the public uh, has uh, options to present information to the ACNC. Our principal uh, resource is uh, a web form that's available on our website. Yep. That allows people to, to submit information uh, to, to help us understand issues uh, that are affecting charities and non-compliance. Yeah. They can also present information over the phone if they choose to do so yeah. or, through, or through written mail. Yep. In, uh, just quickly, in mm. terms of gathering information, I think it's also important to point out that uh, we don't only rely on the public. We also get information from other government agencies yeah. who we yeah. cooperate with uh, and, and also publicly available information. Uh, a lot of information we receive comes to our attention through the media. Yeah. The next sort of, I guess, just, I'll call it a step, but the next sort of point is is the, the monitoring of charities and whether they're meeting uh, their obligations and obviously then the response uh, to, the char to the charities if they're not meeting their obligations. Um, again, sort of a logical flow of, of uh, you know, behaviour, I suppose, from from what the compliance team have to do. Yeah, that's right. I, um, you mentioned earlier that, you know, there's 57,000 plus registered charities. So a principal function that we serve is monitoring those charities to identify those ones that, that um, are, are best need to be addressed so that we yep. support that public trust and confidence. Yep. And as I mentioned, when we're responding to those concerns, we're looking at what the appropriate action is to, to support the charities first yep. and foremost but also if we need to take some kind of enforcement action, yeah. we'll do that. And that leads nicely into what you see on your screen at the moment, which is our, our regulatory approach. Um, Self-explanatory, it's how we approach the regulation of charities. Um, now this includes, you know, uh, the, I guess the, the processes and actions that we need to cover. Um, we're obviously talking about how we investigate charities Ian, and, and what is really important in understanding this in context is to understand our, our regulatory approach um, and to understand that there are, as you said just then, a number of actions we can take before things actually es escalate into an investigation. Yeah, that's right. Um, what, our regulatory approach, where, what is sort of the general thrust? I mean, you can probably read it off the screen there, but when we talk about information and support and education and guidance, um, what, why is that where we start, I guess? Yeah, I think the way I'd respond to that is, is by saying that, you know, we, we really do want to provide education and support to charities that are wanting to do the right thing and, and provide a charitable service to support the Australian community. Uh, we're certainly not out there to get charities. That's yeah. not what we're about. Yeah. Um, we will initiate the work that we do with that mindset that where charities are trying to do the right thing and they may have got off track a little bit, mm -hmm. we'll help them stay on track or get back on track, yeah. track where they are actually are responsive uh, to the concerns that are raised. You know, there are always going to be those, those number of charities that aren't willing to, to do the right thing and work with the ACNC and we yeah. have to take a, a little bit of more of a forthright approach there. But certainly the starting point in our regulatory approach is education and support. And then it's a more graduated approach where we take more forceful actions. Yeah. I should say now that if, if people are interested in looking in more detail at the regulatory approach statement, mm. it is published on the ACNC website yep. if they want to look at that and, in detail. And the link is uh, is there at the, at the bottom of the screen there. Yep. So um, definitely go and have a look. Now, this is one of our handouts. Uh, it's again also on the website. Uh, as well. So if you can't quite see it on the screen, don't fear. Um, you can go and have a look at it on the website. This is our, we call it our pyramid of support and compliance. This sort of bears out what we've just, or what Ian has just been talking about. The base that we build upon is education and support, the guidance materials, education, advice, capacity building, 
uh, all of those sorts of things, even down to things like reminder letters, that's our base point, that's our starting point. So um, this is the context that, you know, through which we talk about today. Now, when we talk about educating and guiding charities, how do we do that? There are obviously website resources, uh, all manner of website resources. Um, there's our governance hub on the website. Um, webinars and podcasts like the one you're in right now, uh, our self-assessments and our self-assessment tool, uh, and obviously again our advice staff and and phone line who do a great job. Um, yeah, and I, I think yeah. I'd, I'd like to to sell some of these resources yeah. because I think it can be valuable to assist charities to support them in in the governance that they're trying to implement with their charities. I mean, the, the Governance Hub is a relatively newer resource where yeah. we bring together a lot of those tools to support charities. And I've actually got it open in front of me at the moment. And the Governance Hub has links to governance standards, uh, the governance toolkit, yeah. also a small charities library, because yeah. we appreciate that it can be challenging for small charities with limited resources to, mm. to actually uh, you know, take up that, that governance and implement good governance. But these tools are there yeah. to support them to yeah. do the work they're doing. And again, I mean, these are tools that, that any charity can access. You don't have to be a charity that might be in contact with uh, the ACNC in terms of any compliance or anything like that. Um, best to get in and, and try and have a look at some of these resources before, uh, before you stray out of the, out of the uh, I guess, from what, between the flags or whatever it is. So yeah, um, that's yeah, right. best and, and have like, a look. They, they are designed to actually support charities and we appreciate mm. that it can be quite daunting for, for charities and maybe a new volunteers uh, come into a charity to take on a role. Where do you start it? It can seem overwhelming, but the resources are designed there. You know, we've got checklists and, and, and tools uh, similar that, that allow people to actually understand, you know, how, how to, to lead into that road to good governance. Yeah. Well done. There we go. Um, now, we've talked about the education side of things and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. We also, as it says here, we will, if we do need to, use our powers when charities do not act lawfully and reasonably. Now, that might mean a response from nearer the top of the pyramid that we just saw. And in that case, it might be some action, some sanction and, and some, some revocations there. So, you know, we have a basis and we work from a certain point, but that doesn't mean that we won't, so veer somewhere else and, and perhaps look at something a little bit harsher if, if required. Um, now, we've got a question here. Ooh, here we go. How many in-jurisdiction concerns did the ACNC receive in the 2018-19 financial year? Now, answer this one in your heads, those who are with us today, whilst you're having a think, and when we say in jurisdiction, can we just give a clarification? What does that actually mean? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as a regulator of charities, we have legislation uh, that we adhere to. So anything that's in jurisdiction needs to, to fall within our legislative powers. So yeah. basically looking at complying with the ACNC's governance standards that can include ensuring uh, that funds and assets are being used for charitable purposes, yeah. where they're not used for charitable purposes. Of course, that's a concern making sure that charities are accountable to its membership, um, ensuring that charities um, have not been involved in fraud or criminal activity. Yeah. Um, and they also need to ensure that the uh, responsible persons of the charity are, are following um, their du the duties of the responsible persons. Yeah. We often internally refer to that as governance standard five, but that's an Definitely. important one. Yeah. They need to make sure they adhere to responsible financial management, active care and diligence in yeah. the best interest of the charity, among other things. Yep. Yeah. So, can I can yeah, I also okay. say? Sorry, uh, no, no, it, it might also uh, work to complement that by saying what is outside the ACNC's jurisdiction. Yes, what we can't deal with. Uh, so, first and foremost, we regulate registered charities. Yeah. So it's not yeah. mandatory for charities to be registered with the ACNC. Though a lot do because the the, the big carrot there is the tax concessions yeah. that charities get. But if a charity chooses not to be registered with the ACNC. If we receive a concern about that charity, it would be outside our jurisdiction and yeah. we wouldn't be able to act on that. We may refer that to other regulators who could take action though. Issues that relate to fundraising uh, is outside our, yeah. our jurisdiction. Yeah. Um, although we do look at charitable funds when they are received and, and make sure they're applied for an appropriate pers uh, purpose. Yeah. We, we can't take action in internal disputes, yeah. 
Um, also the quality of services charities provide, again, outside our jurisdiction. Yeah. They're just examples of others. Um, we have more information on our website, but they're, they're the key ones there. Definitely. And that's a good explanation because, again, a lot of the uh, inquiries we get uh, and that sort of thing often come to us and, and there is that, you know, line of where our jurisdiction might end and where someone else's might be or what is simply outside our jurisdiction. So yeah. that's, that's good to know. Oh, now, drum roll. Here's our answer. There it is. 1,500, actually as you can see on the next slide, because we're going to have a look at some numbers, 1,544 concerns uh, were in the ACNC's jurisdiction during that period of time. Uh, now, 667 of them came to us from uh, members of the general public. Charity employees and charity responsible persons were also um, responsible for a significant number of concerns that were expressed to us. Now, also on that slide right there, uh, we've got some information about what some of those concerns centred around. Yeah, that's right. I'm happy to, to cover that. Yeah. And, and those concerns covered a few areas. Um, some of the, the key ones, a lot covered claims of private benefit yeah. or where a charity may have uh, been alleged to have had a criminal or improper purpose. Also issues of poor governance and charity mismanagement were also a significant focus for the concerns that we received. Yeah. Now, we, we just mentioned some key issues here. So, uh, you know, how did some of those key issues marry up with Big apologies, uh, we have lost sound and now we're back. So that's lovely. Now, Ian, when we were actually in radio silence, yep. you were speaking about one of the best ways to mitigate some of these things is to have, you know, good, solid, robust policies. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. It's about having good governance and, and strong uh, policies and processes support yeah. that good governance and having policies and processes around conflict of interest and, and financial management, but also including, you know, how, you, how your charity provides information to its members. Yeah. Uh, that can go a long way to mitigating these, these risks of it occurring in your charity. And again, I'd, I'd point back to, to those resources we have on the website if you're yeah. asking questions about, oh, well, how do I do this? How do I have a policy around this? the resources on our website will assist charities to do that. And again, that dovetails back to our entire regulatory approach where, where, where the bedrock of what we try and do is, is education, is helping charities you know, with these policies to put them in place and to make sure that they're the best they can be. Yeah, um, that's right. Now, there are, as we've called them here, as they're called, priority areas of compliance as well. These are the issues that are deemed so serious that they are always a priority when it comes to compliance, uh, the compliance team's work and the ACNC overall. Um, now, thankfully, these don't happen very often, but their nature is so serious that they are always a priority. Now, you can see them, see them here up on screen. Um, fraud and financial management is, is one, and we're talking serious stuff here. We're talking things like money laundering, tax avoidance, uh, real private benefit we've mentioned, but private benefit can really get into the realms of very serious if there's a lot of, you know, I'll say the wrong stuff happening. Yeah, that's right. Um, we've got terrorism uh, as a second one. Yeah, I should probably clarify that um, it's about terrorism finance. Terrorism you know, finance there, there are law yes. enforcement authorities that, are, of course, deal with, with terrorism and, and respond to that. Yes, we don't, we the, don't deal with that. <laughs> yeah, the ACNC is about ensuring that, that charities uh, have effective governance in place to ensure that not they're not at risk of terrorism financing. Yeah. So we will um, we will be involved in those areas if that's a concern that's brought to our yeah. attention. We've got safeguarding people here. Um, and that's a nice fancy term for just making sure that you're doing the right thing by all the people that you have contact with. Um, it's safeguarding. We talk vulnerable people here. We, we might be talking children. Um, so if there's a failure to safeguard people, if there's a failure to properly look after um, charity beneficiaries, charity staff, charity volunteers, uh, we see that as the priority area of, of, of compliance. Uh, and the last one is, is um, political or obviously unlawful activities. Yeah, that's right. And that's actually a disqualifying purpose. Yeah. So it's pretty, you know, it happens in, in rare occasions, but it is important to understand that it, you can actually lose your entitlement to be registered as a charity or disqualified as a charity if you have a, a political or unlawful purpose. Yeah. Yep. Not so much uh, activities, although where there are activities involved, we'll look to see if that points towards a purpose. Yep. But if a charity actually takes that step and has a purpose to do those things, that can be disqualifying. Yeah. 
Now, oh, hello, just on the banana peel here. We're going to look at risk and risk assessment. Now, this is another step along the way to um, the investigation side of things. Um, you know, risk, in, risk assessment, um, you know, we've had a look at some of the compliance work, compliance team, regulatory approach, that sort of context and that sort of background. Again, um, this context is important when we are looking at the investigation process. Um, again, it's probably a good time here to emphasise that when we receive a concern, we don't just jump into the deep end and we don't just launch an investigation. Um, one of the key steps that we've got is, is a risk assessment, isn't it, Ian? Yeah, that's right. Um, prior to, to commencing any investigation, we'll undertake a risk assessment to get a better understanding of all the circumstances that we need to, to know so that we can make an informed decision about what's an appropriate response to the concern and the information that we have. Yeah. Um, now, risk assessment. The aim of a risk assessment is, as it says here, is to identify the highest priority risks and intervene before either initial or further harm can be done. Now, the ACNC conducts both proactive and reactive risk assessments. Um, what's, yeah, I'm what, happy to explain yeah, that a little bit We've further. got it here, but what's the, what's the difference? Yeah, as it says on the screen, a proactive risk assessment uh, is where the ACNC initiates an examination of a charity. Mm. Um, so we'll actually look at the information that we have on hand through the information that we gather from charities. It can be the annual information statements. Yeah. It can be the financial records. And a key one, again, I think I mentioned it earlier, is we do cooperate with other government agencies uh, to ensure that we do have a whole of government approach to, yeah. to, to make sure that the charity sector is operating in the best interests of the Australian community. So they're the proactive risk assessments. Uh, the reactive risk assessments, I think people can understand just by, by the term itself, is, is one where we, we undertake uh, action in relation to concerns that we receive yeah. from the public. So things are brought to our attention. Um, I'd also throw uh, information that comes to our attention through the media as a reactive yeah. uh, risk assessment as yeah. well. Uh, so that, that, that's coming from the public in a way, but it's not coming from individuals. Yeah. yeah. Uh, concerns are being brought to our attention through the media. All right. Now, thinking person here, what does a risk assessment involve? Now, we've got the next couple of slides probably give a bit of an explanation as to what risks, risk assessments involve. Yep. Um, the first step or the first thing to think about is the consideration as to whether there are threats or, or vulnerabilities within the charity. Yeah, um, that's right. I mean, do you, I'm happy to talk to yeah. each point a little bit and give a little bit of clarification there. So really there, what we're looking at is, is you know, does, does the charity have robust governance to to mitigate these threats and vulnerabilities. And I might use an example here, you mm. know, an example where a charity might be sending funds overseas to, to support operations or charitable initiatives overseas. What kind of governance do they have in place to ensure that that money is used for the purpose that it's intended? It is mm. not being, um, you know, diverted for, for purposes that it isn't intended. You know, worst case scenario, it could be diverted for terrorism yeah. financing, but it can just be diverted for private benefit as well. So that, that sort of, um, step, I guess, is the the idea perhaps of, of taking the wide view and having a little bit of a look at the charity um, and saying, what is their situation? What do they do? What might they encounter or what could they encounter? So it's that yep. wide view, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, the, the next step and the one on the next screen, um, we'll get through, is um, determining how likely it is that the harm will occur in the future. Yes. And considering the consequences if the harm occurs in the future, they sort of go a little bit hand in hand, I suppose, don't they? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we're, we're looking at the level of severity and the likelihood that that will occur, mm. uh, but, but certainly where, where situations are severe and the harm can be significant, that's that's something that would elevate the, the, the risk assessment and actually lead to a more likely outcome of an investigation. Yep. And determining risk levels and the and the intervention needed, which we've we've sort of uh, discussed. Yeah, that's there. right. Yeah, yeah, I mentioned you know the, the likelihood that it can yeah. occur. It can range from being unlikely to to, to likely or, or certain even, yeah. and also the consequences. Consequences may be insignificant. You know that the charity may have already had things in place to to mitigate uh, the, the the consequences that yeah. may be negative, uh, but there can also be major consequences as well. Before you raise one of our priority harms, which is safeguarding yes. vulnerable beneficiaries. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the threat to public trust and confidence, if there are issues where vulnerable beneficiaries have been harmed, is significant. Yeah. So that's an example of where we would certainly step in and take action. 
Now, our thinking person is back again, uh, asking another question. How does a risk assessment determine if an investigation occurs? And again, there's some, there's some considerations. Um, first one, and we talked about in jurisdiction before, so this is sort of a little bit linked to that. Is there another regulator or agency better place to act? Now, that might be because it's clearly outside our jurisdiction, but it also might be that that regulator, what's, what's the phrase? Yeah, is in a better position, is at the front of the queue when it comes to trying to act on something like that. Yeah, that's right. People may be familiar with the term like red tape reduction, yes. um, which is something that we keep in the forefront of our minds at the ACNC. We, we certainly don't want to make life difficult for charities where it's not necessary. And if a charity is already actively working with another regulator to address concerns, mm -hmm. the ACNC uh, can, can follow in, in, in the trail of that and certainly receive that information to inform what decision we would we yeah. would take, we wouldn't expect the charity to go through that entire process again and yeah. absorb all their time in administration. Um, and the other two points, as you can see here on the screen, is the charity capable or willing to work with the ACNC and, and address the issue? And what is the most efficient response to deliver the desi desired outcome? So yeah. there, there are three key things that are considered um, when we look at whether the risk assessment then leads to an investigation um, and that happens pretty much every way every time that you're looking at this sort of stuff doesn't it yeah that's right and I mean that second dot point is the charity capable and willing to work with the ACNC to address the issue that that's such a, a important factor that um, you know that that's where education and support becomes yeah. a significant consideration if we do have charities that are are transparent and accountable and, and willing to address the issues mm. and work with the ACNC where they're not, of course, then the ACNC may need to take a more forthright action and that can lead to, to more severe outcomes. But yeah, yeah again, I'd, I'd like to, to you know, continue to reiterate the, the education and support that is available to charities. Yeah. What is the most efficient response to deliver the desired outcome? I think it's, it's really difficult to, to give a, you know, definite uh, definition around that because mm -hmm. it can be case by case depending on the circumstances. And I think it's important that we do take the time to consider the individual circumstances of oh, charities absolutely. that we're dealing with. And yeah, charities are all shapes and all sizes and all bits and pieces. So to have a one size fits all is just simply not going to work. So yep. yeah, to, to look at individual charity situations is a very important part of, 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 of what's done. Yep. Ah, now, as you can probably guess by what's up on the screen, the process comes to formal investigation. So we've covered the processes through the ACNC receiving concerns, risk assessments, that's the context, that's the background, formal investigations. Now, if you remember, the number we noted earlier on in our little quiz, the ACNC received just over 1,500 in jurisdiction concerns in the 2018-19 financial year. As you can see on the screen right now, we finalised 100 investigations during that same period. So you can see the, the contrast, the, the contrast between the two numbers. Um, yeah, we've gone from 1500 and something to 100. Why, what, why is there, what is the contrast? Um, not everything clearly goes from concern to investigation. Yep. We've talked about risk assessments, obviously there'd be ways and means of addressing things through you know, that process and communicating with charities. Um, what do compliance do in, in that respect, I suppose? Yeah, I, th I think the key point to make there is, is when the ACNC will act, you know, we'll, we'll act in situations where there's a serious risk to public trust and confidence, yeah. um, and it relates to a charity's compliance with its obligations under the ACNC legislation. So there's a couple of funnels that, that our concerns go through yeah. um, and before we actually get to a point where we would consider commencing an investigation. I think the, the first funnel is, is those concerns in jurisdiction, which we have a large number of, mm. over 1,500, as you mentioned. We'll actually look at the details of those concerns on, on face value initially and actually identify whether we feel the concern is a low, medium or high risk. Yep. Uh, again, you know, when you think back about our, our priority uh, risk areas, uh, terrorism, financing, mm. significant private benefit amongst others, they're the kind of things that would lead to a higher risk. Now, once it passes through that funnel and we've actually got down to a more manageable number, that's when we'll actually undertake the risk assessments for those high risk concerns. Yeah. That's where we bring in a lot more information 
Uh, we may reach out to other government agencies. We'll do a, a, a little bit of a scan of information that's publicly available, either mm -hmm. through the media. We'll even look at uh, websites, open source information, yes. including open source information that relates to the charity itself. So if they've got Facebook pages where they're raising money and things mm -hmm. like that, we'll take all that information into consideration when we're conducting a risk assessment. And again, we, we spoke about risk assessments previously, but yep. we'll be looking at the likelihood and the consequence to actually have a look at those risks following the risk assessment, which are more high risk. Mm. That's where we would be considering to commence an investigation. And as it says here, there is a set process the ACNC adheres to when it comes to investigations, but like each charity is different, each investigation is different. Yeah, so. That's right. Again, not a one size fits all, um, and that's very important to to note. Now, first, I guess step here, gathering information. Again, that's an important part of, I guess, any investigation process. Um, now, I'm guessing that we probably can't tell everyone in detail about how we gather information because obviously we we can't. Um, generally speaking, you've mentioned a couple of things about in, uh, information gathering. Yeah. Um, you, anything that sort of you wish to add uh, in, in addition to that? Yeah, well, at the risk assessment stage, like I said, we'll try to bring together as much information as we, we can to make an informed decision uh, about whether we will commence an investigation. When we do commence an investigation, uh, and it is necessary to do that because of a, a high risk concern, uh, we will commence an investigation, send a notice of that investigation yeah. to the charity. There, there's two ways that we can do that, and that's what that first dot point on the slides yes. are Formal powers to. versus voluntary requests. Yeah, yeah, by and large, we will look to work cooperatively uh, with yes. charities and give them an opportunity to voluntarily respond to an information request and submit information uh, to the ACNC so we have a better understanding of the circumstances and we understand the charity's perspective of the matter. Uh, where it's necessary, we can actually use our formal powers through a formal notice, which mm -hmm. requires a charity to provide information to the ACNC. Yeah, and that sort of leads to the next point here to engagement with the charity during the process. Um, you know, what, what do we look for when we engage with the charity? Um, you know, there's obviously a couple of little cheat notes there on the screen. Yep. It, things like its responses um, and its willingness to address issues. These are things that are taken into account. Um, yeah, I think so. And we, we appreciate the charities will have their side of the story and it's important for us to understand that. But I think what we're looking for is we're looking for transparency and accountability mm. from the charity. And if they have that opportunity to, to respond to, to the concerns that are presented to them and actually present evidence, then that, that's a, a really strong basis for us to consider whether it's appropriate to, to finalise an investigation with education and support. So we're really looking at that cooperation from the charity yeah. to, to be open and accountable and actually let us know what's happening in their charity. All right. Now, we've, we've talked uh, previously in the last few minutes actually about high risk concerns. We will investigate high risk concerns. Now, and again, when we do, we will engage the charity, we will gather information, we'll assess the charity's responses, which is that process yeah, again, I right. suppose. So we won't won't go into that again because we've, we've gone into that. Yes. Um, important note here, and we've said it a couple of times, we'll emphasize it here again. Charities will usually have the opportunity to reach compliance during an investigation rather than have an adverse finding made against them. So when we investigate, the ACNC will still, through its constant contact with the charity, still say, hey, get, get right with us, do, do the right thing. And if, you, you know, if you're doing the right thing, well then, thumbs up to you. Yeah. That's, that's the way we work. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, you know, we of course can't make a promise that that yes. outcome will eventuate <laughs> um, where there are serious concerns and significant non-compliance. Even if a charity says, oh, well, we want an opportunity to do the right thing, the mm -hmm. circumstances may require that we take a forceful action. Yeah. But yeah. it's part of our toolkit uh, that we will consider whether education and support is an appropriate outcome. Yeah. And we will certainly consider doing that where it actually... Uh, it is in, in the best interests of, of the charity and the charity is willing to, to get back on track. Yeah. And it actually um, it, it mitigates those concerns about significant non-compliance if they do uh, want to get back on tra track and are able to do so. Yeah. Um, a couple of other points worth mentioning when we're talking about formal investigations. Um, information information management and, and secrecy. I might, I might sort of get 
Yeah, yeah I'm Ian, happy to uh, expand on a couple of these. I'm happy um, to respond to yeah. that. Yeah. What, what what do we mean when we mention this? Yeah, I guess the the word that jumps out at me there is is the word secrecy. Yes. Uh, because <laughs> the ACNC does have secrecy provisions mm. which require us uh, not to disclose information about the investigations that we are undertaking. We have ACNC protected information, yep. which means we can't disclose that information. And then unless there is a, a lawful provi uh, provision in our ACNC Act to do so, mm. in certain circumstances, we are able to share information with other Australian government agencies yep. where it falls within the powers and functions of that other government agency. But otherwise, the general public, the response would be no. There are very limited circumstances where we can disclose information to the general public. Yeah. I mean, that, that gives charities a little bit of reassurance that while an investigation is on foot, that information isn't going to be disclosed prior to an outcome. Um, however, it does have a, a little bit of a, a two-edged sword kind of approach where a lot of times the ACNC um, is taking action, but because we can't actually say what's happening, the public perception might be that we're, we're not actually taking action. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our, our approach is that um, we need to adhere to the secrecy provisions and, and we will wear that feedback. Yes. Uh, but certainly the secrecy provisions, of course, don't uh, prevent us from cooperating with the charity and sharing information with the charity. Um, now, charities engaging legal representation, um, is, is that... Is that something they they do? Is it is it a common thing? What what happens there? Yeah, there's no obligation for charities mm. to to seek legal uh, representation when they are under investigation by the ACNC. But it's 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 something that the charity may wish to consider uh, to support them to be able to respond to mm. an investigation by the ACNC as the charity's regulator. Uh, it does come at a cost to the charity, of course, unless you can get pro bono yeah, uh, yeah. legal advice. Um, however, it's just one of those things that charities need need to weigh up the circumstances that they're involved in and what is it in the best interest of the charity to do. But certainly, uh, if, if charities are feeling overwhelmed and they feel that it is appropriate to get legal representation, they're entitled to do so. Yeah. And the third point, um, communicating investigation outcomes. Now, we've probably touched on that with what was just discussed a, a, a little while ago. When it comes to communicating investigation outcomes, to the charity, however, yeah. um, what, what what is the the process there? Yeah, so when an investigation is finalised, we'll, we'll send out a finalisation uh, letter to the to the charity, letting them know what the outcome is, and that can range uh, through another uh, number of different actions in our toolkit, which I think we'll go into later. I won't mm. I won't chat about it now, but certainly we we do share the outcome of an investigation with the charity. As I mentioned before in secrecy, we don't more broadly um, talk about the outcomes of investigations to the to the general public. And, and only in certain st circumstances are yeah. we able to publish information on our ACNC re register. Revocations is a good example where we'll publish our revocations on the ACNC register, but not the actual details of the reasoning behind the revocation. We can also publish some summaries of information of our enforcement powers. Um, there have been a number of occasions in the past where we've done that. Again, if people are interested in more detail about that, they could go to our website and actually yes. search up the compliance actions. And there's a list of, of information that we have published on investigation outcomes. And I think that might be also a link that we'll, um, that's in perhaps the handout. We'll also send that link through when we send out the okay. uh, email afterwards. Um, now, how long we take to investigate a charity can vary. Investigations are not set down for a predetermined length of time, mm -hmm. um, but we do have some guidelines on progressing investigations and they come through our service standards. Um, they're the targets we strive for when conducting or, or completing certain tasks. There are service standards that cover charity investigations. They're pretty straightforward, as you can see on the screen. Um, investigations finalised with, within six calendar months, our target is 60%. Investigations finalised within 12 calendar months, our target is 90%. acnc.gov.au slash service standards is the place to go if you want to have a look at those. Whoa, hello, that's bright. Action, there we go. Um, before we go any further now, we've gone through, again, the logical steps towards this, this end of the process. What this shows and what all this context shows is that there is a lot of work that goes on from a compliance perspective before we get to a point where we actually take action. Um, it's the iceberg under the water, it's the duck paddling on the pond. Um, 
the actions we can take in response to an investigation, they're many and varied, uh, and they can range from perhaps something that might seem a bit minor to something that's rather more significant. Um, these two statements are significant, and again, they reflect that regulatory approach. Um, you know, our response to non-compliance is proportionate. We are committed to helping genuine charities get back on track after they encounter compliance issues. Keep these thoughts in your mind as we go through the next few slides, because again, it provides context um, when we discuss the, the actions that the ACNC can take. Yeah, and, and Chris, can I jump mm. in and say, it's been a bit of a theme of the webinar today where we've focused on education and support. And, and I would say that that's true. We are committed to helping genuine charities get back on track after they encounter compliance issues. I think the slides that are upcoming are gonna look at those consequences where yeah. charities aren't willing uh, to, to cooperate and we take some more forceful action. But I would say that, that yes, we, we do have in, in our mind that regulatory pyramid, which the foundation is education and support. And we're not really about punishing charities twice. You know, mm. we, we don't wanna, as a regulator, we don't wanna come in where a charity has been through a difficult situation and they've been a victim of fraud. If they've responded to that appropriately, have taken action themselves and have been transparent and accountable. As a regulator, we'll come in and we'll have an understanding of that. Mm -hmm. It's situations where charities try to sweep matters under the carpet <laughs> that, are, that are a little bit concerning. I think yeah. everyone appreciates that 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 is a reasonable approach to take, yeah. and we'll we'll talk more uh, in the coming slides about some of those more forceful actions. Now, as, as has been mentioned, we've got a lot of tools in our toolbox when it comes to our regulation, regulate you know our role as a regulator. Um, the key thing for us is determining the right tool to get the best result. So again, our starting point is with education and, and, and guidance. Yes. Um, some charities may receive education or a request to complete a self-evaluation. Um, this aims to, as it says here, educate charity, so it arrives at voluntary compliance rather than attract further compliance activity. Now, that self-evaluation, again, there's a link there at the bottom of the, of the uh, screen, that is a really useful tool. And it's also a tool that is a proactive one, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's right, Chris. So it's all about supporting charities to have good governance. And, and our use of a self-evaluation tool in the compliance team uh, we will communicate with charities and, and send out the self-evaluation tool or a link to it, asking charities to, to complete the, the tool themselves. That may or may not be part of an investigation yeah. process. So we can actually do it as a predecessor to an investigation if we think that the concern is, is, is not uh, of a higher priority. Mm. We're just giving a, a charity an opportunity to, to understand how to, you know, get on the right track to good governance and yeah. steps that they can take to do that. Um, where it does happen with an investigation, that's probably a, a response where a charity is able to, to respond to the concerns that we have raised with them and actually evidence to us that by and large, they are attempting to do the right thing or yes. they're back on track. We will just issue a self-evaluation letter uh, to allow them to be aware of, of their broader obligations as a registered charity. Um, and I think the point you made about that link there is while the compliance team may send out a self-evaluation letter to a charity in response to information or concerns that we receive. It's a valuable tool for all charities. Yeah, so they can jump on the website uh, just to use it as an opportunity to improve their governance or yeah. respond to, to maybe a transition in personnel. Mm -hmm. That's a really good tool to help charities understand their obligations. Now, if we're not satisfied with the charity's actions or response during the investigation, there are different tools that we maybe they might be slightly sharper tools that we can grab from the toolbox and use. Um, we can impose an enforcement action or a compliance agreement. We can also revoke the charity's registration. Now, briefly, what's an enforcement action? What's a compliance agreement? Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot happening on this slide, I think, with the different <laughs> actions that we can take in response to an investigation. Um, and I probably would point people back to that that pyramid. I think it's a really good visual and kind of, mm. um, you know, shows that the different times that we would take different action. And at the top of it is uh, revoking a charity's registration in the most serious circumstances uh, where a charity isn't able to, to get back on track uh, and, and the non-compliance and concerns are significant we are able to revoke the charity's registration. I guess people would be interested to know what the consequences of that, and it, and it can be uh, a loss of tax concessions mm. through the Australian Tax Office. So that can have a significant impact on, on, on a charity if that is to occur. 
uh, probably down the pyramid um, a little bit in terms of our graduated and proportionate sanctions are our enforcement actions and, and compliance agreements. Uh, so in, in doing that, enforcement actions are, are available uh, to, to a certain type of charity. Uh, that's probably the reason why they, they aren't widely used. Yeah. There are a limited number of published on, on our compliance actions. Uh, but certainly as part of the investigation process, we would be communicating to charities if, if, if they are subject to an enforcement actions in response to, to the work that we are taking. The, the, the pyramid has, has a number of enforcement actions we could, we could take, including enforceable undertakings, directions, yeah. even suspending or removing responsible, responsible persons, persons or directors yeah. of the charity. Yeah. Compliance agreement is, is probably uh, something where if, if we see that the circumstances that a charity is dealing with are significant, but it's appropriate to allow a charity to remain registered, we can actually work together with the charity okay. to implement some expectations or terms that we would expect them to adhere to. We could do that over a three, six or 12 month period yeah. to allow the charity to, to get back on track and report back to us. Mm. Of course, it is important if we do give charities that opportunity to enter into a compliance agreement that they actually use that opportunity and get back on track because the investigation remains ongoing. And if they don't, and that the non-compliance is still a problem, then we would consider you know, continuing the investigation, and then that could lead to to other use of enforcement actions or even revocation. Yeah. Second question, second quiz question. There we go. How many charities had their registrations revoked after an ACN, ACNC investigation during the 2018-19 financial year? We will give you a couple of seconds of think music. Um, yeah. Have a bit of a look and think. Again, it gives us an opportunity to reflect on the numbers. 1,544 in jurisdiction concerns. 100 investigations during the same period. So again, we're working down the, the numbers here. Drum roll, there we go, it's 12. 12, there we go. So we've gone from 1,500 or more concerns to 100 investigations being finalised to 12 charities having the registration revoked. What it shows is the number of the themes that we've been talking about here, the proportion, uh, the proportionality of our compliance work. Um, the ways and means, we've got various tools in the toolbox and, and how we go about using them. Um, and, you know, it's only an endpoint, I guess, where we're looking at this figure uh, of, of 12. So that gives you a bit of a context as to, you know, where, where we head when it comes to uh, these numbers. Um, oh, yeah, I mean, what I would say there is, uh, I think, you know, the fact that we start out with more than 1500 concerns in our jurisdiction, and that funnels down to, to 12 revocations. I think it emphasises um, that we take steps to, to work together with charities mm. who are willing to do the right thing. And it's only in those circumstances where there are serious and significant issues where, where charities are, are not willing to, to be a transparent and accountable or work with the ACNC that, that it winds up yeah. with a revocation. Now, we've got some numbers here. Again, we'll whip through these ones relatively quickly because we're getting towards the end of proceedings here. Um, 100 investigations, as we know, 12 registrations, uh, charity registrations revoked, 25 compliance agreements, uh, 52 charities received regulatory advice super quickly. What is, what is regulatory advice in this context? Yeah, so regulatory advice, I mean, I think the important word there is advice. Yeah. Um, you know, if we're identifying issues in an investigation and, and we see that there are steps that a charity could take to address that, um, and, you know, they, they are not significant or serious issues that we would allow and trust the charity to respond to that, then we will issue them with some regulatory advice. It, it may relate to to them needing to adopt some policies and processes around a range of issues, could be record keeping, yeah. um, financial management, those kind of things. Cool. Uh, and these figures, by the way, are contained in our annual report. There's a link to the annual report there down the bottom of the screen. Last bit, myths versus facts. So we've got four myths and a couple of them we've already covered. So we're gonna, we're gonna get through these pretty quick, I think. Yeah. But um, just again, to clarify some of the the myths, some of the beliefs, and what the actual facts are. Uh, charities will receive information about the concern against them. That's one myth. The fact is, as we've discussed, we have to protect the privacy of people or agencies referring the information to us. But if the information is being relied on to make an adverse finding against a charity, uh, we will put that information to them. So we're not going to conduct it in radio silence. 
we will put that information to them so they have the chance to, I guess, respond. Yeah, they? that's yeah. right. I think there's two kind of ways to, to look at this this kind of myth. And the, the answer is right in terms of charities may be interested to know the source of the concern. Mm. But certainly as the ACNC mm. compliance team, we have an obligation to protect the privacy of individuals and we can't disclose that information to a charity. Yeah. However, the flip side of that is, you know, the detail of the concern itself, where it doesn't disclose any information about the source of the concern, we we would be open uh, and transparent as we would expect charities to be and present that information to them yeah. so that we can make an informed assessment of the concern. Cool. Second one, charities have no chance for input in, res in response to concerns or during the investigative process. I think, I think I just answered that. Yes, I'm going to say, and I think we've spent a good portion of the last yeah, yeah. 40 or 45 minutes answering that one. So look, um, you can turn the screen. Investigations give charities a chance to provide information and evidence, and evidence is misspelled, so there you go, to help the ACNC understand their particular circumstances. So That's right. Can I, can I say that, you yeah. know, I, we, we do appreciate that it can be a little bit daunting or maybe come as a shock to charities when they receive an investigation notice, but you know, that, that doesn't mean that it's the end point and it's all doom and gloom for the charity. It really is an opportunity at the start of the investigation for the charity to tell their story and respond to the concerns and take an approach that's it's open and transparent mm. so that we can actually understand their circumstances. Third myth, the ACNC will help resolve charities' internal disputes. We've already covered this one. So <clears throat> answer is no, <laughs> we do not. Yeah. So we'll just- Outside our jurisdiction. Yes. Yeah. But there, having said that, there are um, options available to charities that are caught up in internal Absolutely disputes. Absolutely right, yes. Uh, yeah. to, to assist them. The first thing that charities should return to is, is their constitution to work out uh, how, sh how they should deal with matters. Yeah, and like that and they, may, yeah. they, they may wish to, to seek some support um, that is available to, to, to manage uh, dispute resolution. Fourth one, the ACNC regulates charities fundraising. Again, we've covered that and generally no. However, this is always a however, we will look into it when considering charity governance standards, including compliance with Australian law because if a charity is not operating lawfully, uh, big red flag. So yep. generally no, some circumstances we will. Yeah, we, we certainly don't regulate fundraising. That, that sits yes. with the, um, you know, the, the different state and territory. Right, yeah. Uh, government authorities. Uh, however, when funds are raised through fundraising, they become charitable funds and Absolutely. they must solely be used for the charitable purpose. Yeah. Otherwise, that becomes a breach of the ACNC's governance standard one, which is ensuring that charities have a not-for-profit purpose. Yeah. So yeah, yeah there's, there's a little bit of overlap there with, with fundraising, but the basic answer is that no fundraising matters are outside our jurisdiction. All right. Now, we normally pause here for questions. Due to our sound outage earlier on, what we might do is we might just um, gloss over that just quickly. Um, <clears throat> I know that, excuse me, as he loses his voice, uh, I know that <clears throat> a number of you have been sending questions through to us and thank you very much for that. And uh, we've had our friends answering them and typing away madly. Again, if you've got any questions that don't get answered, uh, feel free to perhaps email them through to us and we'll do our best to get back in touch with you. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll wander on from that one. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna wrap up because we've taken up just about an hour of your time and we appreciate everyone hanging with us um, and uh, putting up with a little bit of radio silence and uh, generally joining us for a bit of an explanation about our, our processes and, and that sort of stuff. Um, what we've got, as you can see here, these are the ways that you can get in touch with us. There's all manner of ways you can get in touch with us. Um, we will be uploading a recording of this session to our site before the end of the week. That will be our aim. All our past webinars are available too, part of our whole education and guidance aim that we have. Um, so have a look at the past ones. Um, while you're there, we've got a couple of others that are upcoming. If you want to register for one of them, go for it. Uh, stay in touch through these methods. Uh, our advice line, our advice services line, there's an email address. They're available from uh, nine till five, Monday to Friday. That's Melbourne, Sydney time. Uh, you can email them there. Uh, before we finish, if you've got a few seconds, we'd really appreciate your complete survey that pops up after the uh, webinar. I think it's two or three really quick questions that only take a couple of seconds. We enjoy getting your feedback, so that would be great. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to uh, everyone, uh, to Matt, to uh, Sarah Jane, to Gulnar, who are all typing away madly. Thank you, especially to you, Ian. Um, very informative. So thanks heaps for sharing that information and for your time. 
No, thanks, Chrissy. I really appreciate it. I appreciate everyone's participation today. Um, I hope it's been a useful resource for you. No problems. And we will wander off. So until next time, we bid you farewell. See you later.